Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth session in American English Live Series 18. We're so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Chris, and I'll be with you here today, along with my colleague behind the scenes, Dorea, who will be the moderator, helping answer your questions and responding to your comments during the session. So let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, Critical Thinking in the EFL Classroom, Engaging and Empowering Students with Sina Chu Moraz. So first up, we have a wonderful comment from Diego from Paraguay. Diego says, thank you very much. It was a fantastic session. The activities were very practical. I'm going to apply them in my classroom to develop critical thinking skills with my students. That's wonderful here, Diego. Next up, we have Seth from Burundi. Seth says, I was hesitant to use critical thinking with beginners, but now I know how to do it. The strategies presented have empowered me to enable my students to develop their language acquisition easily. Then we have Halima from Morocco. Halima says, it was really great. I used to be scared to incorporate critical thinking in my class, but now I feel confident to start adapting my lessons and using critical thinking strategies. Thank you for what you are doing for the ELT community. Thank you, Halima. So we love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your thoughts about our webinars by offering feedback to the end of session quiz form or by e emailing American English webinars at FHI360.org. We may feature one of your comments during the next session. Throughout series 18, we are exploring the themes of social emotional learning and integrating critical thinking in ELT. We hope you are able to use the practical ideas we share. So here's what to expect today. Today's session will be about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I as your host will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our wonderful audience, so we can address your ideas and experiences. So please continue to share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. And then when our session ends, you'll have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Please click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. Once you have successfully passed the quiz, you can expect to get your badge via email within about a week. And before we begin this morning here in Washington, D.C., we want to let you know about one of our current massive open online courses or MOOCs, English for Media Literacy for Educators. In this free course, participants will learn effective and engaging approaches to teaching about MIDI media literacy, a key 21st century skill in the EFL classroom. Registration is now open, and you can use the link being shared by the moderator to learn more and enroll today. And now for today's webinar, thinking critically about illustrations. Every culture has its own unique visual art forms, be they drawing and painting, crafts, architecture, or filmmaking. However, visual content is sometimes overlooked in ELT especially at intermediate and advanced levels. Despite research that indicates interpreting illustration requires and develops critical thinking skills. In resource limited classrooms, textbooks are often the primary contents resource for both teachers and students. In an effective textbook, illustrations are not merely decorative. Interpreting an illustration can be a window into the climax of the story, the mood of a poem, or the comparative importance of characters. In an English class, all of this translates into language learning. In today's presentation, we will analyze visual art features and how illustrations can be used for critical thinking skills, development, and different writing genre activities. 
and we are pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Hema Ramanathan. Hema believes that education is a public discipline. Teaching is a social act and research and education should mirror these concepts. Her academic focus is teacher education and she has taught English language and literature in India, Indonesia, and Malaysia. After almost 25 years of teaching at United States universities, she moved to India to work with teachers as a senior advisor and educational consultant. Hema has over 75 publications and 190 presentations and workshops on ELT and teacher education in India and in the United States. She recently edited and co-authored an English textbook series for grades one to eight and authored an online course in art integrated learning. Welcome, Hema. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for the welcome. Uh, and all of you, welcome to a topic that I find fascinating and about which I keep learning every day. No, I'm not a ghost. I'm an actual person. But I like the lines and the colors in this picture, which is why I used it. Okay. All right. You know, we often say pictures are worth a thousand words and pictures tell a story. But we don't pay them more than lip service, do we? We don't really use those pictures very much as we learned in the uh, uh, poll earlier in the teaching learning process. And there's no reason why we shouldn't. So let's explore how we can modify our teaching habits. And this is a quick overview of what we'll be doing over the next 15 minutes. Uh, a short reminder of what we mean by the visual arts and what the elements are. And then we do a, an exhaustive dive into questioning. What are questions we ask and don't ask about illustrations? What can we ask? And then we do a walkthrough of two examples of the descriptive and narrative genres, and then follow that up with a rundown of the grammatical categories that we can use when we critically use illustrations in our classrooms. And then a final review of what we've done so far. Are you all ready? Let's go to the next slide. This is what you'll find. When you see a, an icon that looks like a palette that artists use, you know, we often say, what's in your mind? So now we say, what's on your palette? So that icon tells you that you have to respond to a question that we ask. And you can respond in the comment section or in the chat, whatever you feel like and wherever you can. The printer icon on a slide essentially says, you can print it for it to make sense for you and for you to use it in your classroom, for you to have it with you when you plan your lessons. So that's the takeaway slide and the takeaway material that we're offering, okay? We're gonna look at the elements of visual arts. Let's look at the fundamentals first before we move on to anything else. All right. Are we ready to, for you to start thinking? On this slide, do you see a palette and a question? So think about what terms come to mind when you think about the elements of visual art. So when I say, visual art. What are the words that come to your mind? Put them down in the chat or uh, in the comment section and we'll discuss it, okay? Yeah, everybody, let us know in the chat box and help us answer Dr. Hema's question. So what terms come to mind when you think about the elements of visual arts? We'd love to see you all participating with us today. And Dr. Hema, I'm already seeing wonderful mm. comments coming through. I'm seeing Diego Barton saying creative paintings. Uh, we've got a participant saying photography or photographic or create. Uh, we have Yoko Murai saying creativity. 
everyone's uh, giving lot, you lots of greetings. I'm so happy to be here today as well, too. Uh, we have Farid saying, mixing colors. Um, so lots of wonderful comments today. People from all over the world joining us are super excited. We have Manuel saying, images particularly shown. We have Sassoon saying, painting. We have lots of painting. Oh, here, I like this one. AJ is saying, boundless and yeah. tranquility. Lots of wonderful comments. Thank you so much, everybody. Please keep them coming throughout today's session. Thank you, Chris. That was a really good overview. And let's go on to the next slide and we can see how many of these did you mention? And how many of these, apart from these, did you mention? There were colors. I'm not sure that I saw lines, uh, perspective, placement, shape, patterns. I saw texture which is wonderful because it's not something that we think of very commonly when we talk about painting. Unless you're a painter and you're talking about oils, then you talk about texture, right? But let's talk about uh, some of the other items. I mean, all of you know about color and lines, curved lines, straight lines, and you know how they make a painting. Uh, you know placement, because when you talk about what is next to what and what is behind what, you look at placement, right? But let's talk about a couple of other things. Chris, are you ready? Yes, I am it? ready. Yeah. All right. I'm so <laughs> excited. <laughs> look at this picture and tell me what element. Okay. Oh, think? this is a yeah, this is a wonderful picture. Um, based on the different elements, I'm gonna have to say I believe this would deal with perspective. Yep, on the nose, right you are. All right. Got it. So do you see how the buildings seem to get closer and smaller as it goes away from the foreground and the street seems to be narrower? Perspective is always easier to demonstrate and to show than to describe. This is perspective, absolutely on. Ready for the next one, Chris? Yes, let's see this okay. image. Um, I need to tell you there are two terms in this. Okay. So let's see if you can come up with both terms. Okay, again, a wonderful picture. Um, as far as elements, the first thing that comes to my mind is shape and forms, I would say. Yes, yeah, yeah. This is, of course, a picture of a vase being painted. What is a shape and what is a form? We all know what shape is. Squares, rectangles, triangles. They're all 3D figures that we draw on paper, right? Those are shapes. And we see many of these shapes in this. What is a form? A form is a 3D, not a 2D. A shape is, is a 2D. A form is a 3D. So you have a circle and you have a sphere, which is a 3D. You have a square, which is a 2D. And you have a cube, which is a 3D. You have a triangle, which is a 2D. And you have a pyramid, which is a 3D. Right? Okay. Let's go on to the next one. All right. What do you see? I think this is. Okay. Ooh, maybe this one is a little tricky. I see two windows, or actually 12 windows. So I'm going to have to say the element that I recognize is symmetry. Yeah, you got it. But when you talked about the two windows, that was the element of pattern, right? You talked about 12 mm. panes, six in each window, and you talked about the 12 panes. Now, if you were to divide this picture vertically and then, symmetry, and then horizontally, you'd get symmetry. If you divide it vertically, what do you see? Six panes on one side, six panes on the other. And the middle pane is open, right? It's the same pattern. It's a repetition of a pattern which creates symmetry. So all of us have know what symmetry is like in letters. You divide A horizontal, sorry, vertically, you get a you get a symmetry. You divide B horizontally, fold it over, it's the same thing right? So that's symmetry, symmetry in letters. And in the kindergarten, when we teach 
students to begin writing, we teach them symmetry, right? Okay, this is the final one, Chris. Okay, oh, I recognize this photo. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is a very famous place in America. This I recognize this as Mount Rushmore, yes. some of America's greatest present, presidents. But for identifying the element, uh, I'm going to have to say that this is texture. Absolutely, got it. And this is how texture is created in a visual. I mean, this is a sculpture. You're right, it's at Mount Brushmore in uh, South Dakota. And these are uh, sculptures on a mountainside. But when you take a photograph of that, it becomes a visual. And we had somebody in the chat who said, photograph, visual, when we present word association. And how is that texture created here? The texture, the feeling of roughness. Texture is usually, you know, we feel rough, smooth, hard, soft, sticky, slinky, silky. That's touch, right? And how do you create touch here? When you create a sense of folds, when you get a sense of what you would actually touch it and what it would feel like. That's the texture and great artists create that texture. So look for that. That really is what distinguishes the goats from the sheep, the really great artists from the artists who also paint. And now, what's on your palette? Time for a little introspection. Yeah, good going, Chris. Let's look at which element do you use most often in your teaching? Many of you said you use it occasionally, elements of, of uh, visual arts, but let's look at what you use when you use it. Which element do you use most often? Hey, everybody, let us know in, in the chat or comments box about which element of these awesome elements that Dr. Hema just described and we went through, do you use most often in your teaching and why? And you'll see at the bottom of the slide the, the elements that we discussed, color, line, pattern, perspective. Let us know. All right, we'll give people a few moments, Doctor, to let people comment. And I'm seeing Valentina is saying color, shape, and lines. Mary saying color and line for kindergarten and beginning writing. That's great, Mary. And we have Diego Martin saying color. Uh, we have GM Virgo saying color. Azar is saying perspective. Yes, yeah, so lots of different teachers as you many different things. And I do want to share a couple comments with you, doctor, yeah. and with the audience. Um, <laughs> so we have some great from, from earlier. We have uh, Irada is saying that pictures are a perfect way to make students speak and to speak out their ideas. That's a great comment. And yeah. then lots of people are excited for your presentation today. Rosetta is saying, excellent teaching on today's topic. You can see imaginative dancing and coloring images. So this yeah. is wonderful. And then, yeah, lots of people are saying, we have one good comment from Fatima saying, um, actually these comments are actually, these are all incorporated. I try to teach all of these wonderful elements. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Please, again, keep the comments coming throughout today's session. Thank you so much. You know, I saw when you said colors and lines, yes, you use them when, when the children are young. Remember, it's only as children grow older and the frontal lobes start developing, can they start looking at things like perspective. Till then, they don't really have the physical ability to do that. Not all of them do. Most of them are therefore able to see color, lines. They see patterns as they grow older. You know, when we teach, when people teach math, why is math so difficult at the lower grades? Because the kids can't see the patterns very easily. And math is all about patterns, right? And that's the reason why we don't use a lot of different kinds of patterns when we use in, the, in the lower grades. But as you grow up, as you go into middle school, you start using perspectives, you start using uh, symmetry because they can see that, yeah? Think about you uh, teaching uh, similes. Similes are with patterns. What do you see in one that you see in the other? It has to do with pattern making, yeah? 
So when you teach similes, think of it as a, as a way of teaching them what a pattern is. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think the teachers are really resonating with us, Doctor. We have uh, Anna Lima saying that she never thought about the elements individually in her teaching practice. So this is great. I think that lots of our teachers in our audience are really excited and mm. excited to incorporate this into their, their teaching moving forward. <laughs> All right, and moving on to the next section. Uh, and this is the really most difficult one because we're going to talk about questions, creating questions. Uh, this is the Washington Monument in the reflection pool, and we've got lines, colors, uh, pattern, we've got symmetry, uh, we've got perspective, uh, placement, everything in this picture. It's a great picture uh, for us to look at what all the elements are. Asking questions is tough, but it is a really important responsibility that we have to provoke thinking in our students. So what kinds of questions do we ask? On what basis do we formulate the questions? Chris, I'm going to come back to you. Okay. What questions would you ask if you were to look at this picture? Okay. Well, first of all, I love the picture of the Washington Monument. I'm lucky enough to live very close yeah. by and, and got to see that yesterday. Um, so questions that I would ask my students about this illustration and I'm looking at this illustration, I'm trying to identify some of the, um, the elements that you described earlier, but I would probably start off with the basic questions of like the who, the what, the where, and the why of the question to begin with. Yep, very good beginning point, excellent beginning. Basic stuff, who, what, where, and when. Right, so we talk about the object, we talk about the geographical location, and we, this is the setting, right? And then we look at the time and the date. Let's take a look at the next slide. The one thing I want you to remember before we go any deeper into questions is asking questions about art is a great way because art is all about interpretation. There's no right or wrong. It's how you think about it, what you actually see in it. So getting our students to see different things is what we do. And that's why we ask questions about art. So what are the questions we usually ask? We ask st students questions about remember, understand, which for many of you, you've probably read about Bloom's taxonomy and forgotten. It's at the lowest level of the taxonomy, right? The bottom two levels. Let's go a little further up. What are the questions we do not ask usually, but maybe we should? Those that look at the higher order, those that are about moods and emotions. Yeah, we, we talk about uh, describe, label, list, match, name, when we want to talk about the who, what, when, where. When we talk about the higher order of application, evaluation, valuation, how do we value what we see? How do we organize something, right? Then we are talking about perspective and placement uh, and form and symmetry and texture. Now, this much I need to say, we don't have the time to ask all the questions that we want to, we just don't, we are teachers and we're bound by time. So which ones will you choose to ask when you next use this illustration? Think about that for a few minutes, okay? I just want to say this too, what can you actually do because you don't have time? First thing, continue asking the WH questions, okay? Because those are basic. Without that, it's without the basic questions, you can't go further up the ladder to the higher order thinking. Add to this list elements like placement, space, pattern, symmetry, perspective questions, right? So you choose which ones you want to ask depending on the picture that you have, depending on what you want students to think about. 
what is the object that meets the eye first? What is it that you have to look for very closely in that picture? In this one, you have to look very closely to see the ship, which is almost at the horizon, right? And then you ask another question, following through with tone or mood. How does it make you feel when you fee see that ship so far away? Do you think it's coming in, going out? Do you feel you want to wave out to them? Do you want to wave them in? Look at the color, look at the placement, look at the trees. Are the trees on the right-hand side really taller, bigger, or smaller than the ones on the left-hand side, Cliff? Right? So you have some others that focus on mood, on emotion, on atmosphere. Many of the questions we ask are factual, but what we can actually see. But if we ask our students questions that guide them beyond the obvious, if we want them to move on to analysis or evaluation, then the questions that you ask can focus on emotions, feelings, responses, and reactions to. Organize and value, for instance, add texture and life to the stories we tell by adding details and interpretations. So if we want our students to be better writers, more effective writers, more sensitive writers, we need to bring into play these other things from the affective domain. Tone, mood, atmosphere. They're all apparent in this picture. We need to ask questions about that. Okay, time for more reflection. Think about another question that you could ask about this illustration. Think about any one element that you hadn't thought of earlier. And what question could you ask about that? Yeah, doctor, as we give our audience members some time to think about that, and everyone please respond in the chat box, we wanna read it out. I just wanna share with you, doctor, some wonderful comments. Um, we have a great activity that I like to do as a teacher too, called See, Think, Wonder. Uh, a teacher was commenting using images like, what do you think? What do you see? What do you wonder? Yeah. So that's a great activity. And then maybe a little bit more difficult question. One of our teachers in our audience um, is talking about and has a comment and a question about our culture is dominated by images and illustrations. So they're wondering how can students learn um, and to see and interpret the visual world around them when their vocabulary is limited or they come from a very impoverished or poor um, region of the world. So that's a very uh, may important I, question. May I respond to that, Chris? Absolutely, please. There is, I don't think there's any such thing as poverty of sight. There are different oh, kinds of uh, images that we have around us. Whether those images portray what we want them to portray is another point. But the ability to see, the ability to observe, the ability to understand visually what, where we are. I mean, I, I take your point. You live in an arid area and there are no trees, there's no water, uh, everything is blocks of cinder and you're living in apartments and all you can see are rectangle, sorry, cubicles that people are living, it can get very boring. But to be able to see that and say, this is boring. And why is it boring? Because of the pattern and the symmetry, the sameness that the symmetry costs, right? That is interpreting what they see around them. So then you ask, how would you change that? What would you do to the window that overlooks you, the street? in your apartment. How would you make that window from the street down look different? Maybe put the glass, maybe put different colors, maybe put sun catches. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's great. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. And we have lots of other new comments coming in about the question we have on the screen about what other questions can we ask that illustrations to get us, our students to think critically. Uh, I see a lot of our teachers in our audience are saying like, how do you feel about this image? Um, what do you feel if you lived here? 
Or can you think about a place in your country perhaps that is similar to this picture? Um, we have Manuel Montero saying, what messages would you withdraw from this image? Or what colors would you change in this picture? That's from yeah. Diego Martinez. Very nice. And we have Embry says, would you like to live at this place for a week <laughs> or forever? Um, we have, uh, which items would you carry with you to go to this place? Right. Or a few other comments before we move on. Again, lots of people are saying about the feelings. How do you feel when looking at this place? And then we have someone saying, if you were there, what would you do? Um, these are great. Thank you, everybody, so much for these great comments. Thank you so much. Keep them coming. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, a quick word about this. I want to say this again. Be intentional about the question you ask. As for poverty and access to information and access to pictures, um, there is a slide, the last slide, in fact, in this presentation that I've put in has some sources that are free. Uh, a lot of museums around the world have uh, put up a lot of their uh, material and, and uh, their artifacts online, and you can use them in the class. Uh, the other thing, students have pictures in their heads. Have them put them down. And it can be by hand, it can be electronic, they can draw, they can paint, use charcoal, use the sand, get sand together and let them draw in the sand, especially the younger ones. Use local newspapers. So th they are around us, we just need to look a little more. All right, let's look at the next one. This is perspective and this picture brings together a lot of what elements we've been talking about, right? And I'm gonna leave you with that for now. But the next four slides, we'll walk through how you use a picture to do a descriptive writing activity. Okay. And we can do this with, uh, I'll show you another picture. This is not the one that we're looking at, but if you're looking at a picture, then we're looking at beginner to advanced and we're looking at perspective, color and art elements, right? How do you actually do this thing? You pick an image. And remember, if kids don't like the image, they're not going to study it. So pick something that appeals to them. If it's winter and it's very snowy, then getting something which shows warmth is very attractive. If it's really hot, like many of us live in very hot countries, finding a very cool green picture can make students want to look at the picture a little longer. So look at what picture students would want to look at. Select two, maximum of three elements that you want to focus on. And then you create uh, questions. You need to be sure which questions you absolutely want to ask. There'll be other questions that come up, like they have come up here. And of course, all of us reteach vocabulary. Pre-teach it and reteach it and go back over it again. And then share the image. And have students write 80 words, maybe, about the setting. Let's take a look at one, shall we? Let's look at the questions that we can ask with this. We talk about who, what do you see here? What time of day is it? What year time of the year could it be? Where is the light the strongest? which gives them the sense of perspective, which focuses on perspective. And look at the last one, which is really where I want to, what objects and movements could you add to the scene? In, one, in a way, it brings it alive for them, right? So when you look at the picture of this, that's what you see here. Let's move on to the next slide, shall we? Are there any concerns here that you would like to share, Chris? Let's move on. No, yeah, just a couple, not okay. necessarily concerns, but some nice comments. Um, people just all over are just really enjoying the session with you, doctor. Um, and we have a nice comment from Rosetta saying um, that she thinks as educators or teachers, 
that we should start using uh, imaginative imagery more. And she's yeah. looking forward to do that in her class a lot more. Mm -hmm. And um, people just really enjoying that. Yes, not only about art, but also about learning language and teaching. And people are making the connections of like using these concepts mm -hmm. to become better English language teachers. And uh, lots of comments from one from Manuel saying that he's enjoying these this advice and this tip that he is looking forward to enhance them and use them as classes to improve his classes. So lots of great comments. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So no, no concerns. Everyone is so excited. Yeah, uh, but the next slide actually gives two different uh, levels of writing that we can do with this, which is our concern. We have people who are here teaching nursery and others who are teaching high school, if not higher up. Uh, so how can we differentiate this writing for proficiency levels? For the beginners, like I, like I said earlier, focus on sight obvious elements, right? For the intermediate, add some details that you can see in the uh, parenthesis, right? Details about what is the tunnel made of? What is it? Uh, for the advanced, have them think a little further. Remember we said earlier, what is it that you can add to the picture? Sounds and a storyline that you can bring up. But even with the description, talk about a little more in detail. Uh, Chris, would you like to read uh, the advanced uh, beginning of the story? Yes, absolutely. Um, let me see here. So I'll read the bottom part, correct, Doctor? The yeah. advanced beginning. Okay, so it says, the silence of the scene was broken by a sharp whistle. Greg stood watching as the intensity of the bright light increased with the approaching train. As it thundered past him, the leafy green tunnel absorbed the sound of its whistle, even as a stone tunnel would have echoed it, increasing the volume. When the train was gone, the scene fell back into its usual calmness, emphasized by the contrast of green of the bushy tunnel and the brown of the train tracks. And that's really what it is. So if you pre-teach things like tunnel, thundering, train track, calm or calmness, silence, the advanced can then do a lot more of contrasting, whereas the beginners can do description, basic description of what they see. And that language is easier for them to get. Time for you to think and for you to have questions. And we're really going to talk about what language categories, you know, adjectives, nouns, et cetera, would your students use when discussing these illustrations? So think about the language that makes the advanced writer's paragraph more evocative. Yeah, everybody, let us know what language categories would students use when discussing illustrations? Doctor gave us some examples here on the screen. So, so please let us know in the chat box about the different language categories um, that students would use when discussing illustrations. We've got some examples here, such as nouns or adjectives. So we'd love to hear from you. So doctor, we have uh, Lucy uh, T is saying adjectives. Um, lots of teachers are saying, oh, doctor, I love this approach. They're so excited to incorporate this. We have uh, Subi saying adjectives. Seeing lots of responses saying adjectives so far, um, and people giving people are giving examples of adjectives okay. as well. Okay. <laughs> and we have a uh, theme. Yeah, and, but and, think about. Yeah. I'm sorry. Think about nouns because a lot of the uh, abstract nouns are the ones that create emotion, and give a sense of the mood, like silence and calmness, loudness. Right. So, yeah, we have a great comment. Mm -hmm. Some teachers like, yeah, absolutely. Nouns as well. And a great comment. Just It just really depends on the goals or objectives for their class or for that specific lesson of what they're working on, too. We have mm -hmm. Anna Lima commenting as well. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Very quickly in the next slide, uh, we have two, two columns, right? 
all of us know that we we can use uh, nouns which are common, proper, concrete, collective, countable, uncountable nouns. We use adjectives of different kinds, uh, adverbs, definitely prepositions, and we've got the interrogatives: who, what, when, where. But if you want students to do uh, better writing, then enriching items of what you're looking at, which is why abstract nouns add to it comparative and superlative adjectives that are origin, proper nouns, but origin nouns, adjectives. Adverbs of manner make a huge difference to how you read it and how the passage reads, yeah? Okay, the next one, let's look at the second activity. Let's look at a picture that can be used to build character. This time we look at colors, perspective, and include placement, okay? Let's go to the, this is what we do when we talk about uh, reviewing the steps as we go through as instructors. Like the last time, we pick an image, we give guiding questions, um, we select uh, a couple of uh, elements to focus on, we pre-teach relevant vocabulary, we share the image, but when you're looking at characters, what you really can do is provide a graphic organizer. They can, of course, write one or two paragraphs on each of the characters, but putting them into a graphic organizer moves it from seeing the picture into using the visual form, okay? I'm not going to go into what graphic organizers are, that's for, for another workshop at some point of time that I'm sure they log that AE will organize for you. Um, let's take a look at a picture, shall we? Look at this picture, time to think and write. You see the uh, uh, palettes there? So look at this picture. What questions could we ask about the characters in this picture? Don't talk about the plot. Okay, talk about the characters that you see in this picture. Yeah, what an interesting picture, everybody. So let us know uh, in the chats by looking at this. Think about, as Doctor said, just about the characters in this illustration. So what questions would you ask? And please, please let us know. This is such an interesting image. I've got so many questions myself, Doctor, but I wanna hear from our wonderful audience about what they think. Um, we have Fahim saying, uh, which elephant is more merciful? That's an interesting question. Yeah. We have Anna saying, what is the relationship between these characters? And Diego is saying, what do you think they'll do next? And then Karima, uh, one of our wonderful uh, followers and teachers, why is the baby left out in the street? <laughs> um, <laughs> So lots of interesting questions. Some people said, is that the Jumanji movie? That's from Salvador. So um, <laughs> lots of great questions. So someone's like, can wild animals be a part of society? Or how could yeah. they live in a harmonious way? These are wonderful questions. We have the best audience, doctor. These are great. Keep them coming, everybody. Yes. We do, we do. <laughs> Let's move on to the next slide and let's take a look at some of the possible questions, shall we? Uh, oh, who's that? We have, to, no, normally when we think about characters, especially in the middle and high school, we think of humans. We don't necessarily think of animals as characters, uh, unless you're doing a, an Ice Age movie, maybe. But even that, you know, we tend to think of as cartoons. Uh, so you usually ask, you know, name the characters, who are they? And if they're animals, we don't always give them names. We call them by the genus it is, you know, like a rhino or an elephant, but we don't give them names. A uh, couple of questions you can ask at the, uh, uh, and those are questions you ask at the elementary stage, but the last two that you really look at uh, in the middle of the high school, in fact, you know, uh, why is there a light at the vanishing point of the perspective? Why is that lit up? Why is a backlight rather than a light up in front? That's a question. So that kind of moves it into maybe a dystopia story, a dystopic story. 
uh, maybe it's fantasy. Uh, another question that we have about color. We often think about rainbow colors, bright colors. Now this picture is in sepia or a brown color, which gives you the sense of, you know, 1920s picture. Early photography used to be in sepia, right? Why is this in sepia? What does it make you think then? Where are these characters from? Are they real? Are they imaginary? Are they, and you're right, are they safe? Is a baby safe? Is a baby complaining to somebody? Is it a multiverse? Yeah. So those are questions that you can ask. Let's try that one more time. List, this is the palette, right? Are you ready to share? List one or two vocabulary items you would pre-teach for this activity if you had this picture. And do it at your grade level. Yeah, everybody, let us know. Um, Doctor, we have lots of interesting comments coming in about that last uh, that last <laughs> image. Wonderful questions. Um, and so, yeah, as we move forward, we ask you teachers out there, let us know about what you would pre-teach uh, for a writing activity. And as Doctor said, like think about your grade level. Are you teaching elementary? Are you teaching high school students? So let us know about one or two vocabulary words or items that you would pre-teach uh, for this writing activity. And let us know what also what level you teach. Um, doctor, we have some comments coming in. This is an interesting. Uh, Fahim saying color conglomeration. Um, then for early uh, or younger students, uh, some basic vocabulary such as animals. Yeah. And as we move up to more intermediate, uh, we have Valentina saying avenue or passerby. Um, for lower students, again, going back to the basics, uh, basic adjectives or colors and shapes. Um, and then as we advance, maybe talking about the personality. Um, so just landscape, portraits, talking about feelings, and then such as compassion or empathy. Um, so lots of great words that our teachers, our wonderful audience would pre-teach vocabulary. Yeah. And uh, much of what we really need to think about is what they need to know to feel and to observe right so that they can put those into words which is what vocabulary items we pick uh, so whether we teach them sepia or whether we teach them brown tint whether we teach them rhino and elephant or whether we just teach animal whether we teach uh, abstract nouns such as safety and fear hmm? and contrasts this is a great way to, uh, that you would uh, pre-teach uh, contrasting words Okay, let's go to the next one. How can we actually modify this activity for different levels of learners, especially the vocabulary? Okay. One, for the uh, lower levels, uh, for the elementary grades, uh, doing a vocab chart is great. And doing a speech balloon for each of those characters where students can fill in that speech balloon would work. That would help them see who the characters are and how they are different from each other. And like somebody, and all of you said colors, different kinds of colors. What color would you add to a picture like this? Where would you add the, pic the color and why? What, what would make a difference in that picture if you added color? For a middle or a high school, uh, as a pre or a post teaching activity, reading a poem, this is this could be about climate change, as somebody said. Yeah. So reading something like Escape, which talks about animals in an urban setting. Uh, creating a, 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 a word wall, creating a pre writing word wall and build that over three days, not just the day before or when you want them to write. And the word ball will make a difference, especially if you've got them a post, a pre-writing that helps them see that, okay?
any anything else that that you'd like to bring up chris any comments and questions yeah we've got some wonderful comments again people are so excited doctor um we've got teachers saying dr hema can you please come to my school in my country to, to I'd help love us to. <laughs> i love this we this is uh from rosetta and uh guiana she said i wish dr hema could come help us us teachers in guiana i'm so, getting the next plane out chris Okay, wonderful. Well, we're hoping we're helping all these teachers. I know you're helping all the teachers. And then we have um, another comment from uh, Wilma Salas saying that the use of illustrations or pictures in teaching English language is such an effective tool in teaching about climate change and other environmental issues. So I think that's really important. And so they're identifying this. They can help us talk about climate change and environmental issues to integrate language teaching with social and environmental awareness. I think that's a wonderful comment from uh, William Salas. Yeah. You know, the reason I put up this uh, image is because it has a shadow and an object. So we're looking forward, we're looking at, uh, at something backward. And that's what we always do. This picture brings together the whole idea of interpretation is integral to something like this. And it's a very simple picture for students to see, black and white, but effective in terms of black and white. You have one, one image that is filled in and another image which is sketched. Yeah, all right. Let's do the review. In the next slide, when we talk about uh, what we've done in the past 15 minutes, We've looked at the elements of art forms, some that are common, some that are not, some that we knew, some that we've learned about. We've talked about how to make questions and what kinds of questions we can ask and what kinds of questions we can continue and pursue asking. We've worked on a descriptive and a narrative uh, genre. And we've talked about uh, language items that we can use. And I love that somebody talked about Guillermo del Toro. Yes. His style of photography, his style of framing a scene is brilliant. Absolutely. Can I do one more uh, palette from you? One last question. What is the one thing that you've learned or relearned, been reminded of, or that you plan to do from today's uh, session? That will that will take into your classroom. That you will do tomorrow in your classroom. What would you like to do? Yeah, everybody, let us know. Dr. Hema gave us so many great ideas today from today's session. So, what are, what are going to be your takeaways? What's one thing that you learned today that you're excited about implementing or doing in your class tomorrow, or perhaps something different? We'd love to hear from you and why we let these people, our wonderful teachers comment, Doctor, a few more comments. People are just so excited to, I think, just incorporate all of these ideas too. Um, they're just, they're, Diego says, I will absolutely apply what I learned today into my classroom. You are fantastic. Thank you so much. So how about some uh, more specific ideas, everybody? We'd love to hear. So yes, we've got from Anna saying, Asking questions related to art elements like the, the, the sapia question or lighting. Fahim saying like using visuals to learn about different ideas or to building mind images, um, looking at things from a different perspective or a different view. Um, so lots of great ideas. So we have Saria saying, I learned the perfect way to implement techniques of using illustrations and images. I've never used them. I'm looking forward to that. And lots of people just saying, uh, I teach writing, so um, just to bring in different activities mm -hmm. and provide images to stimulate and motivate my students to be more creative and to kind of enhance their 21st century skills. Yeah, I think uh, our students see a lot of movies. They see lots of pictures and they see everything around them. So picking out what we want to do, uh, one of the things that you actually can do is have your students take photos of what they like and pick a couple of photos that they can do in their group work, right? So you don't always have to provide the picture. Let them provide, you pick what suits you. And especially now with the ubiquitous uh, cell phone cameras, 
taking a picture is not a very difficult thing for them to do. Yeah, thank you all so much. I love talking about what we can do with our teaching. And the artwork gives me so much joy. And we have artwork in our textbooks, you know, some shape or form, maybe it's sophisticated, maybe it's too simple. Uh, maybe it's not something that you find very attractive, but they can help many of our students who are not verbal learners, who are visual learners. Remember, research says that we think in pictures and then we add words to those pictures to express ourselves. So helping students identify what is in the picture and to critically look at a picture makes it so much easier for them to peg the words that they need to use to be able to write and communicate. I hope you find the pages uh, useful and you've had a good time with the session. I've had a brilliant time. This last slide, I just want to leave you with this. And I want you to close your eyes. Think of a picture in your book or whatever you've seen that you really like. I love this one. This one is so vibrant and colorful. And yet with all the movement, there's a certain stillness and a certain thoughtfulness in this picture. So think of a picture that you really like and carry that away with you in your heart and your mind's eye. Thank you very much for joining me on this journey to learn more about using the visual arts to aid our students in their thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hema. Thank you so much. We've got so many wonderful comments coming in. People are saying thank you to you from all over the world, our, our wonderful audience. People are saying that you're so creative and you're motivating them with these fresh ideas on different levels of teaching. Um, this has been wonderful to help us all analyze visual art features and to think about illustrations and how we can use them for critical thinking, as well as uh, demonstrating how us as teachers can encourage our students the use of using illustrations in different writing genres. So thank you. Big, big, big thank you to you, Doctor. But of course, we know we have to thank our wonderful audience. Wonderful, awesome engagement today and great participation. So please, everybody, I can see all the comments coming in on Facebook. So continue to share your ideas, continue to share your thoughts and comments. Um, if you're at a viewing group, please discuss. We are so excited that you guys can get together to talk about this wonderful topic today.